Well, obviously, AI is one of the most uh, profound transformations happening in the world and in the world of technology in the last several decades. Uh, I think what we are seeing is that every business and every board is now trying to figure out what does it mean for them, what does it mean in terms of opportunities, threats, and uh, they are looking at it very seriously. But I do believe that enterprise AI, which is what companies have to do, is a longer cycle than consumer AI. Because the consumer AI, you can get a chatbot and start working. Enterprise AI requires firms to reinvent themselves internally. So it's a longer haul, but definitely it's a huge thing happening right now. So who wins when it comes to enterprise AI? There's a lot of data to protect around firewalls. There's a lot of trusted companies that have moved very aggressive to, aggressively to hyperscale and trying to offer generic versions where you simply just plug in your own data and NVIDIA sure. is a great example of that. Who wins then? Is it Silicon Valley names? Well, I think uh, certainly in the uh, chip side, I know firms like NVIDIA and so on, but I think uh, enterprise AI, the winners are not yet very clear because uh, it's a lot about data because uh, firms have to organize the data to be AI, consumable by AI, disparate sources, they have silos, uh, they have unstructured and structured data. So there's a lot going on. So I think it's early days yet as to who will be the winners, uh, but I think it's going to create some very successful companies out of this. I'm fascinated around the large language model space because we've seen in Europe a number of startups have gone from not even in existence to, to multi-billion dollar propositions overnight because they are in the LLM space. France has got one and the French president told me we needed to, to get these companies going because they had the ability to, to connect in their own language with their own information and, and cultural backdrop. How does this look in the very key Indian market that is growing so rapidly? Are the LLMs major Indian VC or major Indian startups? Well, there are many companies now coming up with uh, which are building India-specific uh, LLM-based solutions for Indian languages. Uh, we have a company called Sarvam AI and Truthrim, which is there are many companies doing that. And uh, of course, uh, large firms like Infosys are also investing hugely in AI. So I think what's going to happen is that because AI is fi finally dependent on the data it's trained on, every part of the world which has unique data will require to do something about training the models for that data. And ultimately, the models will become more commoditized and the value will sw switch to the application and layer of the whole stack. No, no, just um, lovely to see you, by the way. Um, let me echo Karen's thoughts there. Um, in terms of AI, just one or two more from me before we move on to other issues. You have, apparently, 317,240 employees. I, I guess that's a give or take. It's a huge number. You are a significant employer in the IT, so outsourcing, consultancy, a massive employer in India as well. How many of those employees are going to lose their job with the AI boom? Because as brilliant as, as your services are, a lot of them now, given everything you two have just said as well, are going to be overtaken by technology. No, actually, they'll, actually, it'll boom because while you're right in saying that the productivity of software development will improve considerably, uh, thanks to all the automation possible and the co-pilots and so on. In reality, we are at the very early days of a global 10, 20 year uh, cycle of reinventing companies in, internally with AI technology. Mm. So while the productivity will go up, the new business that is going to come in enterprise AI transformation will more than make up for it. I hope that's the case in some ways, just from a customer experience, or at least I hope the chatbots get a lot better, because I struggle. I have to go through multiple stages. I think all our viewers will echo that. I mean, I don't know if you have the same problem, but even before I can get to speak to someone, I, I do go through various levels of chatbots now, or, or the equivalent as well. But you're saying this is a 15 to 20 year journey before actually the people I'm speaking to now will not no. necessarily be redundant, but be, be less important. No, I meant that it'll take the entire industry around the world so long, but there'll be many early companies that will adopt it. So my point is that there's going to be enough work for firms to do, to do the AI transformation, which will make up for the fact that the productivity also is going up. Got it. I want to bring up the term Finternet. This is not something we've spoken about yet at some of our big technology conferences, but it is an element of things that have come before. What is the role of, a, of tokenization? How do you talk about using crypto when some of that technology trying to assure transactions happen quickly versus all the processing that we know today? What are you seeing on this front? Because you're seen as one of the key players in the Finternet. How transformational will it be? Well, the Finternet is actually a paper which Augustine Carstens, the general manager of BIS, and I published recently. 
And basically, uh, what we believe is that tokenization is actually a very powerful idea because you can take an asset and make it fungible, transportable, secure, tamper-proof, and so on. But we need to bring tokenization to the mainstream world. So the Finternet essentially takes the power of tokenization and the many benefits of that and brings it to the mainstream world of banks and uh, you know, other regulated enterprises. So it's a very, uh, it's a basically a, a pretty uh, audacious uh, plan to transform financial services and it's getting tremendous interest around the world. Nandan, you have built up, been one of the builders of the most extraordinary success story as well, but you know better than I will ever know in my lifetime how many failures there are of, of companies before you get to the one that goes 10x or goes exponential as well. You have a, a vehicle called Fundamentum as well, which is your own VC as well. We had a brilliant guest actually in that seat yesterday talking about the blurring of the lines between private equity and venture capital as well. Just tell us about where we're at in terms of venture capital for technology companies, given at the moment we're in this fa phase where so many people are giving us so many exciting propositions, but so many of them are going to fail. Well, of course, the nature of VC is such that for every one success, there are many failures. That's the that's the nature of the game. But I think particularly in India, there's been a huge boom. Uh, India had 1,000 startups in 2016, and today it has 100,000 startups. And there's a huge amount of money coming in, angel money, VC, mezzanine, growth funds. And uh, while there, many of them are, of course, uh, struggling, very, m a few of them have broken out and are doing extremely well. So I think uh, certainly in India, I see a booming VC industry. The other big thing which is happening is that Indian startups are going public. And so they're now coming to the Indian capital markets and delivering very good performance. So the maturity has come of age, where startups are now becoming public companies. So I think it's all in a good place. Great. Can I ask you about some of the major players and, and what that dominance looks like at this stage, even as we talk about competitors and startups? The reality is that there are a couple of big names from NVIDIA, Microsoft, OpenAI, Apple, and some of these names looking at investing in OpenAI. That's been one of the big stories we've been reporting on. And to me, it looks just too cozy that you've got NVIDIA relying on open AI orders on chips. You've got Apple relying on open AI to run its AI intelligence, which is going to power the future of the business. Microsoft has invested in open AI as well, and a lot of its big products uh, are also reliant on this technology. Does that cozy club worry you when we're talking about trying to get new competitors in a monumental technology revolution? Well, first of all, I think that uh, there are many more companies in this space. I mean, Google is there, which is doing very well with Gemini. Uh, uh, Meta has come out with the open source Llama 3.1. So I think uh, while there will be a lot of big tech companies, I think there will be a lot of competition. And finally, AI is about usage. AI is about making it convenient for businesses and consumers. And that's a long way off. So I think these are just the infrastructure pieces. But over the next few years, the applications on top of this will get built. And that will be far more democratized. Nandan, um, former President Trump is talking about blanket tariffs across the board with especially punitive action towards China uh, if indeed he becomes the next president. Do you, A, on one hand, get excited about the prospect of nearshoring, friendshoring that India could be a beneficiary, but on the other side have grave concerns uh, about the rise of protectionism? Well, uh, you know, of course, tariffs is way above my pay grade. Uh, oh, I don't believe that for one minute, sir. <laughs> but I do believe that India has benefited from uh, some of the geopolitical trends. Uh, more and more firms are looking at diversifying the supply chain, having more resilience, having new countries and sources. And India is a beneficiary of that. We have seen that uh, in uh, pharmaceuticals. We're seeing that in consumer electronics. So I do believe, yes, India actually is a beneficiary of the global trend towards diversification and resilience of supply chains. Mm.